Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, The Dynamics of Beta Amyloid Plaque Genesis, an in vivo study in transgenic mice of Alzheimer's disease. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar being part of the search theory presented by Labroots and sponsored by Bitplane, the world's leading 3D interactive microscopy image analysis software company. In the search webinar series, we'll invite researchers from the top scientific and medical institutions who have dedicated their work to discover new therapeutic agents or vaccines for some of the most severe diseases of the 21st century. We are delighted to discover that in many cases, Imaris, Bitplane, and the new technologies implemented in on-door systems and cameras have pushed the research forward, putting the scientists closer to, the, to finding new therapies. For more information, please visit bitplane.com slash search. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Stefan Burgold is a postdoctoral researcher with a strong focus on imaging technology and its applications at the Department for Translational Brain Research. Professor Dr. Johann Hems of the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, DZNE, in Munich, Germany. St. Peter's is a German biochemist with a strong focus on neuroscience and neurodegenerative diseases. He received his education at the University of Hamburg, the Paris de Joyeux University, and the Free University of Berlin. I will now turn it over to St. Peter's for his presentation. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction, and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, so the two of us, we are working in the lab of jo um, Professor Jochen Hans in Munich, and uh, the lab is focused on Alzheimer research. Um, today we will show you how to measure the dynamics of beta amyloid plaque genesis, and um, in this regard, we will first give a short introduction to Alzheimer's disease for those who are not so familiar with the topic. And then uh, the main part will be about the methodology that we apply, including in vivo to photon microscopy and a detailed image analysis. And then we will show the results. And finally, we will come to an outlook how these findings can be used to test therapeutic strategies and what are important considerations during the planning of such experiments. OK. Um, so the Alzheimer's disease is a devastating disorder, affecting approximately 44 million people worldwide. The first clinical symptom that Alzheimer patients experience is the loss of episodic memory. And it is exactly this slowly progressing loss of memories making Alzheimer's disease a tragic disorder. When we lose our memories, we lose our personality, and this is similar like losing our face. Of course, it is not only a terrifying experience for the patients themselves, but also for their relatives. In addition, the disease imposes a tremendous economic burden on the society. To date, no cure is available that can halt or at least slow down this degradation. Therefore, current therapies are restricted only to symptomatic treatment and caregiving. However, new promising drugs targets have been found and are under investigation. So, and when we now have a look at the brain of an asthma patient, we can observe a severe atrophy of tissue, as you see in this image. The loss of brain substance is caused by a loss of neurons and their synapses. And this is thought to cause the loss of cognitive functions. Here on the right image, we see a historical brain section from the first asthma patient, Augusta Deda. And in this image, we can nicely see the two microscopic hallmarks of this disease. First here on the right, amyloid plaques, and then on the left, neurofibrillary tangles. And um, the main component of amyloid plaques was found to be the amyloid beta peptide, or also shortly a beta. It is derived by a sequential cleavage of the amyloid precursor protein APP. 
Now, the cause and the sequence of events leading to the Alzheimer's disease were postulated in the amyloid cascade hypothesis. It starts with the aberrant metabolism of APP, leading to the formation of an amyloid beta peptide that is prone to aggregate. And this aggregation is thought to initiate the deadly cascade. Here you see a beta monomer, and this one can now form oligomers, protofibrils, amyloid fibrils, and finally large microscopic plaques. As next step in this cascade, we observe progressive synaptic and neuronal injuries. And this is followed by widespread neuronal dysfunction and cell death. And at the very end of the cascade, we diagnose Alzheimer's dementia. So um, for our study, we use the TG2576 mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, which is based on the amyloid cascade hypothesis we just explained to you. Um, this mouse line was developed in the lab of Greg Cole and expresses a human APP with a Swedish mutation. A beta is released from APP by sequential enzymatic cleavage, first by the beta secretase and then by the gamma secretase. And the Swedish mutation harbors an exchange of two amino acids at the beta secretase cleavage site and results in the increased production of human A beta. In this mouse model, uh, synaptic injuries start as early as three months of age, as you see here, and this is followed by the first cognitive deficits at, eight, uh, at six months of age, and finally, patho uh, amyloid pathology starts at nine months of age, and in this mouse line, progresses relatively slowly. So um, when we want to measure a therapeutic effect on amyloid plaque growth, we face the problem of broad plaque size distributions. In the picture above, we see an example of a plaque that was imaged ex vivo in a brain section of a TG2576 mouse. In the chart on the left, we see the sizes of plaques measured at 12 months of age. It is obvious from this chart that they are much more smaller than larger plaques. When we have a look at the size distributions of plaques in the second chart, this becomes even more obvious. So um, the plaque sizes at a given age are scattered over a quite la uh, large range of sizes. And um, yeah, you can see this here. Um, when you now transform the data to a logarithmic scale, we can nicely fit a Gaussian curve to this data. Thus, the plaque size is log normally distributed, which is in line with findings in humans with the Alzheimer's disease. In 18-month-old mice, the plaque sizes are shifted towards larger values, as you see here in the blue line. However, there is still a big overlap between both distributions. And of course, it would be possible to measure this small difference with a single time point analysis using ex vivo data. But when we want to evaluate a therapeutic effect with small difference, uh, this, this small difference that you see here refers to the 100% control value. And therefore, it is almost impossible to detect moderate therapeutic effects in the range of 20 to 40%, because the shift in size that you have, you have to measure would simply be too small. Now, uh, to increase the statistical power, we image the same population of plaques many times over several months to obtain kinetic measurements of individual plaques. And for this, we applied in vivo to phonon microscopy, a technique that we would like to introduce in the next slide. Okay, um, here on the upper left, you see a typical to photon microscope in our lab. Um, with an anesthetized mouse already placed underneath. And um, the nonlinear effect of two photon excitation takes place when two photons coincide on a fluorescent molecule. These photons must have twice the wavelength, or in other words, half the energy that is necessary for the excitation by a single photon, shown here in these two um, Leblancy diagrams. At normal light intensities, two photon excitation is very unlikely to take place. To, to get an impression of this almost impossible event, I want to tell you a short comparison by Winfried Denk and Karel Svoboda, who are two pioneers of this technique. 
So imagine a sunny day when all of us would wear sunglasses. With a good one, uh, with, a, with a good one or two photon absorber on this sunny day, around one photon per second is absorbed via a one photon absorber. And um, whereas only one photon per 10 million years would be absorbed via a two photon event. Um, but when you, have a use, when you use a pulse laser um, with a high peak power and focus the laser beam, we obtain measurable fluorescent excitation that is restricted to the focal spot. Moreover, we get intrinsic optical sectioning within the z-direction, in contrast to one photon excitation where the whole light cone is excited. And in these two pictures, um, it's very nicely illustrated the effect um, here. Um, these are two um, fluorescent filled cuvettes. And in the case of single photon excitation, the whole laser beam is visible, as you see on the right, whereas on a two photon excitation, the fluorescence is restricted to a single focal spot. So the main advantages here over conventional laser scanning microscopy are first the much greater penetration depths of over 800 micrometers into brain tissue, then intrinsic optical sectioning, and also a reduction in phototoxicity. Through scanning in XY direction in this microscope and automated movement in Z direction, we obtain a point-by-point -point 3D data set for each detection channel. And this, uh, this data set can then be reconstructed and can be displayed as a 3D volume rendered image, as you see here on the upper right. In green color, we see neurites labeled with a yellow fluorescent protein in the mouse cortex. And in blue, we see amyloid plaques stained with a small molecule fluorescent dye called metoxy XO4. Now, to gain direct optical access to the brain, we used an open skull cranial window preparation that you see here on the left. Um, for the window implantation, a small piece of skull of about four to five millimeters in diameter is removed and replaced by a, gla um, by a glass window. This glass cover slip is glued to the skull with dental cement. And as you see it very well in this image, a small metal bar is glued right next to it. And this, met this metal bar is, um, um, so is used to easily fixate the anesthetized mouse under the microscope and without any rotational artifacts. And through this glass window, we can now see the brain. And the stable blood vessel pattern that we see here is very useful for us to precisely relocate the imaged positions from one imaging session to another. The third image here shows the image portion that is visible in the white field mode of the microscope. And finally, a rectangular chunk of brain tissue can be recorded via laser scanning. And in this example, we see the signal again from amyloid plaques stained with metoxy XO4. Mm, this chunk has an approximate size of half a millimeter in XY and 0.3 millimeters in, in depth. While the unique blood vessel pattern of the brain surface that you see in the second uh, image on the left is used for rough repositioning, we use the positions of these labeled plaques that you see on the right for fine-tuned alignments. Thus, we can record the amyloid pathology at a precisely defined location repeatedly over a long period of time. So, um, and in the next slide, we want to show you an example of, an, of amyloid plaque growth kinetics. The movie you will see is a timeless movie that was acquired over a period of more than one year. Here you see the first time on of the image series that was acquired by in vivo two photon microscopy. To stain amyloid plaques in vivo, we used the fluorescent small molecule dye metoxy X04. This dye was developed in the lab of William Clunk. It passes the blood-brain barrier and specifically binds to the beta sheet structure of the crippular amyloid beta species. The spatial dimensions of the 3D stack are 850 times 850 micrometer in XY plane and 350 micrometer in depth from the brain surface. In the beginning, we see four plaques in the 3D volume rendered image. Starting the time series, we can observe that new plaques develop and that all plaques grow over time. This few seconds lasting time-lapse movie was acquired over a period 
for 15 months in reality. Imaging was done in weekly intervals. In addition, we can detect the development of a typical cerebral amyloid angiopathy. These long structures are composed of aggregated protein that covers the blood vessel wall. So, after completing the acquisition of our time-lapse movie, uh, now we want to perform a quantitative analysis of the image data we, we obtained. And so, to track the precise volume of single amyloid plaques over time, uh, 3D surface rendering is performed using Imaris, a software for 3D and 4D analysis. And in the next movie, we want to show you how we perform the analysis practically. For the 3D data analysis, we use Imaris, but you could use any other software capable of doing a 3D surface rendering. Here you see the software, and in the center, the image data is displayed in two dimensions. And <clears throat> here we have our timeline. And on the left, we can scroll through the image stack. We can start. And the dark blue colors constitute the background, like here, and uh, with the darkest portions representing blood vessels. So, like these structures here. So now it's this here. And the bright parts show the signal from the amyloid plaques. So these are these here. Now we can also switch to the 3D mode of the software. And <clears throat> here we see the 3D volume rendered image. And we can change the display settings, for example, here to 400 to hide the background to better see our amyloid plaques. And we can easily rotate the image and watch our image volume from the side. And we can go back to the top view. And there are also different rendering modes. So we can use this blend mode, for example, or also this normal shading mode. And we have already loaded a time series into Imaris, and uh, we can watch here the time lapse. Next, we want to perform the surface rendering to extract the volumes of single plaques over time. To do this, we use the surface function in Imaris and click here. And this wizard opens up and guides us through the analysis. So we uncheck segment region of interest, only region of interest, and we keep track surfaces over time enabled. Then we click next. And <clears throat> we use, we have only one channel that we use. We keep the smoothing option enabled, and we use the background subtraction as the thresholding method. And here we enter the diameter of the largest plaque, which is around 25 micrometer in this case. Now we click Next, and the computer is calculating the surfaces, which takes some time. So the calculation is now finished. 
and we already see our surfaces for this threshold here and we change the threshold to 500 and this threshold will automatically used for all time points uh, in this analysis and now we want to calculate the surfaces the surface rendering itself is uh, finished now and we can uncheck here the imaging volume and we keep our surfaces here and in the next step we can apply filters and <clears throat> to classify specific objects and one problem in the analysis is the presence of small autofluorescent structures in brain tissue and that are also detected in the same emission channel as the metoxy signal from the plaques and we characterize these autofluorescent uh, structures and they are usually very small like for example these ones and they are not stable over time so you can see there are some points that are come up one time point and then go away the next and um, we want to exclude them from the analysis or during the analysis and therefore we consider two filtering steps and uh, first we apply a filter to include objects only larger than 10 micrometers so therefore we change this filter here to volume choose volume and we have already our 10 micrometer threshold here and now 402 out of 548 objects are selected. Now we click next and within this uh, wizard field we could manually process the detected surfaces but we will skip this step and during our analysis and now we come to the tracking tab and here we use uh, the algorithm Brownian motion to track our plaques over time. As parameters, we use 20 micrometer as maximum distance, and we use as maximum gap size zero. And now we click next, and the computer is calculating. So now we see our tracks uh, here on the screen, but not our surfaces. So therefore I go to the settings tab and I choose here surface style surface. Now we see them again. And at this stage you could also apply a filter to the tracking results, but we will skip this step by now. Therefore we delete this filter and finish our tracking and our analysis wizard. Now we can inspect the detected tracks and as an example we select the spec big black here and first before we can select it we have to go to the track tab and now it is selected and on the left side we see here the complete tracks and the red track uh, is, refers to the selected black of course and now here we have our time points our different time points and we see however uh, the last time point is not uh, correctly detected and included in this tracking and the reason for this incomplete tracking is the imperfect alignment of the different time points and we can clearly see this when we watch the time-lapse movie of the surfaces we see how the drift between the time points and <clears throat> therefore we will use three correctly detected tracks that go over the complete duration uh, to align the time-lapse movie over time so and therefore I will choose for example this one here it goes over the complete duration and we add 
this one is also present for eight ten points and the third one and we see all three are present at all time points. And now we press this correct drift button here. So a new pop-up appears and as algorithm we use translational and rotational drift and the resulting data set size should be cropped to the largest common region. So now we press OK and it will correct our time-lapse movie. So the drift correction is completed by now and when we watch the time-lapse movie again we can clearly see that the uh, alignment is much better over time than before. And with this optimized alignment of our objects here, we will perform the tracking again. Therefore, we go here to this rebuild tab and we choose as algorithm only the tracking and we click on the rebuild button. So we have already our algorithm stated here, drawn in motion and the parameters we will also take again as before and click next and now it calculates and it's finished and we finish the tracking and now we go back again to the tracking tab and select our big black from the analysis and we see that the track is now completed over the complete duration of eight time points. Let's come to the last step uh, of our analysis. As mentioned before, one important criterion to separate autofluorescence from amulet plaques is the stability of time. And we consider the objects as plaques uh, when they are present for at least three time points in a row and when they are present until the last time point. And therefore we apply another filter. So first we have to go here to this filter tab that we can apply to our objects and we click the add button and the first filter we apply will be um, time index filter. So we choose this from this menu and go to the time index. So now we have chosen this and we ch adjust our range that only tracks are detected or selected that have an object at the last time point. We duplicate our selection to a new surface, so we have it now here. And from this subselection, we again filter for track duration, so excluding tracks that are shorter than three time points. Therefore, we go again to the filter tab, add a filter, and choose track duration here. And now we adjust the range that only tracks are detected that are present for at least three time points. This is like this in this case and we duplicate our selection again to a new surface. And Now you can see our result of the analysis and when we go back to the track tab, we see that we have only plaques that are present at the last time point and we have plaques that are present for the whole imaging period and we have new appearing plaques that 
come up during the imaging duration. And let's run the time lapse movie again. And now we see this unstable pattern has gone away. Finally, we can go to the statistic tab. So because we, of course, we want to have now our numbers from the, from the analysis. And what we are interested in is, of course, the, the volume over time. Therefore, we go here to the statistic tab and choose detailed. And we can choose from this specific values the volume of our objects. And to export them, we can click here on this disk. And the menu is popping up, and we can save our file. And our analysis is finished. So our image analysis is finished now. And we get an Excel sheet with all our numbers. And here we plot the volume of a single plaque into a graph. And unfortunately, there's a problem with displaying the chart. So on the x-axis, you would see the age and months ranging from 12 to 23 months. And on the y-axis, uh, we see the volume from 0 to 60,000 cubic micrometers. Fortunately, uh, we still see most of the values. and. To this data, a cubic function can be nicely fitted. And please note the very high regression coefficient, which indicates an almost perfect fit. From the volume, we calculate the plaque radii, assuming a spheric shape of the amulet plaques. And we see that the increase in radius follows a linear function. And correspondingly, we can also perform a linear regression and the slope of this line corresponds to the linear growth rate of the amulet plaques. This linearization was developed in the lab of Matthias Jucker in Tübing, Germany. This linear growth rate means that in our example, a layer of beta amulet with a thickness of about half a micrometer is deposited every week. And this is similar uh, to the annual rings of a tree, but of course these are added every year. To complete the list of quantitative parameters, the plaque density was also analyzed. Now let's have a look at the complete data from the movie we watched before. In this graph, we see the mean volume of all plaques imaged over time with their 95% confidence intervals, starting at 12 months of age. To this data, a sigmoid function can be nicely fitted, which reflects the early and strong cubic growth phase and the late saturation phase of plug growth. In contrast, the plug density kinetics show an asymptotic progression reaching a plateau. When we have a look on the volume kinetics of all individual plaques from this experiment, we see the great variability between the growth kinetics. Again, we can observe that only a few plaques become very big, whereas the majority is mid to small sized. With this long-term imaging study over 50 months, we were able to show for the first time a complete plaque growth kinetics in an Alzheimer mouse model showing both a cubic as well as a saturation phase. Interestingly, when we compare the kinetics to in vitro studies, we see the same sigmoid growth curve, but over a shorter duration of, of days to weeks. Importantly, a biomarker study in Alzheimer patients utilizing PET imaging in combination with the amulet binding agent Pittsburgh compound B also show a similar trend of a beta deposition. Here, the time frame of deposition until saturation 
takes about 20 years. Interestingly, the clinical symptom onset, which is the reference point zero on the x-axis, coincides with this time point of saturation. From all these observations, we can conclude that amyloid plaques grow continuously over time until plaque growth tapers off at older ages. Well, in vivo imaging over 15 months is very difficult to perform, of course. And in order to get data from a higher number of mice, we compared the plaque growth kinetics between a young and old cohort of mice between 12 and 14 and 18 and 20 months. We chose the age cohorts in a way that they reflect the cubic and the saturation phase of plaque growth. In the young cohort, the mean plaque density shown on the y-axis increased over the observation period of two months due to many newly formed plaques during this period. Plaque density was even higher in the old cohort, <clears throat> but at this age, no newly formed plaques were observed. And therefore, we don't see a further increase in plaque density between 18 and 20 months. We can conclude that the plaque density increases strongly with age and reaches a plateau. These observations correspond again to the plaque density kinetics of the long-term imaging experiment. Plaque size measurements calculated as mean plaque radius also showed an increase with aging. This let us suggest that the plaques, plaques grow over time. As expected, the smallest size category were the newly formed plaques, it's the left column. And in the old cohort, there is still a very small increase in the mean plaque size over the two-month observation period. So at 18 and 20 months on the right, the two right columns. But this difference is not statistically significant. Next, we compared the median plaque growth rates of the newly formed and the pre-existing plaques. Um, the median plaque growth rates were not different in the young cohort of mice, so for between the newly formed and the pre-existing plaques. However, the median plaque growth rates are significantly higher than zero, leading to the conclusion that plaques grow continuously over time. In contrast, the median plaque growth rate showed a significant decrease in the old cohort with a, with a median value still above zero. The fact that we can still detect a significant growth in the old cohort with our kinetic parameter proves that this parameter is more sensitive in comparison to simple size measurements at single time points. In this regard, please remember that in the old cohort, we could not detect a difference in plaque radius, what I've shown you in the slide before. So now let's come back to our growth model. And in the young cohort, a layer of constant thickness is added every week, similar to the tree rings, what we see here in this picture. At older ages, the thickness of the rings decreases. In the case of the tree, maybe due to a lack in nutrients. In the case of plaque growth, the ever-increasing surface of amyloid plaques need an ever-increasing amount of A-beta to keep a constant thickness of each layer that is added every week. In the old cohort, the amount of A-beta needed to keep the growth rate of the young cohort might exceed this, the amount that is actually produced. And therefore, the thickness of the layers added every week is smaller than in the younger cohort. This is similar to the lack in nutrients in the case of the tree which led to thinner annual rings at later ages or older ages. On this last slide, we want to summarize important considerations to investigate the therapeutic efficacy of new drugs that target the amyloid pathology. First, a huge number of different Alzheimer's mouse models are available. Each model 
has different plug growth kinetics and a different onset of amyloid pathology. Therefore, it is important to choose the correct age for imaging amyloid plug growth kinetics. Another important issue is the therapeutic strategy that needs to be tested. If it aims at preventing amyloid formation and growth, the ideal growth phase would be the dynamic cubic phase, what we see here in this illustration. In this regard, the most interesting parameters would be the plug growth and plug density kinetics, which reflects the plug formation. <clears throat> if the therapeutic strategy aims at targeting existing amyloid plaques, the ideal growth rate would be the saturation or late cubic phase, when a lot of amyloid plaques are already existing. Here, the most interesting parameters for the analysis are the plug growth rates in order to measure if the plug growth holds or even reverses by the therapy. With this very last slide, uh, I want to acknowledge some people. First, our boss, Jochen Herms, who, for all his support and giving us the opportunity to do these studies. And of course, I want also to thank all our lab members, what you see on the left picture. And I want to thank our collaborators, Boris Schmidt and Daniel Kieser, who provided us with the, uh, with the amyloid binding agent, Metoxy X04. And on the right side, you see uh, our new, new building, uh, where we are located since last November. And of course, I want also to thank all, uh, all um, all people who are interested in our seminar, and uh, I want to also thank the organizers from Lab Roots and from Andor and Bitplane. Thank you very much. Thank you for the informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, can you perform this experiment with different than two photon microscopy settings? Um, well, um, to, um, to perform this experiment, uh, well, it's necessary to use uh, two-photon microscopy uh, in order to image the plaque growth kinetics in, in living animals over time because it gives the best uh, contrast and has the best uh, penetration depth um, compared to, to, for example, confocal microscopy. And <clears throat> uh, of course, one could think about uh, different in vivo imaging techniques like, for example, acousto-optic uh, imaging or, or other in vivo imaging techniques that would be definitely possible or uh, maybe also PET imaging and micro PET imaging, and, uh, uh, which is also also already used with Alzheimer mouse models to translate um, uh, data from mouse models to 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 the humans. Can you also measure cell pathology with this method? Um, <clears throat> do you want to answer, Finn? Maybe. Yeah. So uh, this is actually a question of um, of the stain this, in this case. So the Metoxy X04 is a very good stain. It's very bright, and you can um, get a, you can very well detect it. Um, so uh, to my knowledge, so the tau is not really well stainable in vivo and recordable in vivo. But we have um, we are testing, for example, FSB, which seems to work out. Have you used this two-photon microscopy to test any therapeutic molecule? Um, yes, uh, we already did. Um, so one, 
one study is already published. They retested an antibody or two different antibodies, uh, but they were not uh, able to uh, to decrease or or yeah to to change the the amyloid pathology in this mouse model. Um, and yeah, well, we also do test some some other uh, molecules, but this is not yet published and not yet finished so far. Yeah. All right. What area of the brain are you looking at, and do you see any regional differences in plaque formation based on ages? Um, so the first question. So we are working the, always in the viral cortex, and the second question I didn't really get. What, what was it? Okay, let's see. Um, what area of the brain are you looking at, um, and do you see any regional differences in plaque formation oh. based okay. on um, ages, okay. the, the age of the of the person? Um, well, the um, so normally we, we look in, in the soma somatosensory sensory cortex, um, and of course, the, there is a difference uh, between when you look at different ages in the in the mouse uh, or in the mouse model, and there is there is also a difference in um, in the amyloid load or the plaque density, for example, in different brain regions. But this depends on on the mouse model you will use. So some mouse models. Um, have a stronger plaque pathology and some some less, yeah. But overall, the variation is quite high. Sorry. Okay. Do you have the behavioral data for your mice to correlate plaque growth with cognitive decline? Uh, well, so far we we haven't done these uh, kind of experiments, so we have don't have a correlation to. Behavioral data, no. Next question is a bit of a two-parter. Can we eradicate the formation of the plaques with help of medications and also before it progresses to Alzheimer's? No. So this is not possible. There's no way. OK. Um, what, is the, what is the half-life of your fluorescence probe with the mouse, and how much is getting into the brain? Well, actually, this is a three-parter, so you'll see how you want to answer it. First part is, what is the half-life of your fluorescence probe in a mouse? How much is getting into the brain, and is it commercially available? Um, so answering first the last question, and uh, yes, it is uh, commercially available. And the half-life is quite short. So it's, um, it enters the brain very fast. Um, there is already a publication out um, from Brian Basky from Harvard University who uh, studied this. And um, so the brain is also cleared quite fast from this uh, agent, but uh, the dye itself uh, sticks very strongly to the amyloid plaques. So once you stain the amyloid plaques uh, with this with this dye, so I've never seen that it disappears again. So you also see it afterwards when you fix your brain or perfuse your brain and and remove the brain and make slices. So you still see it. Okay. And did you discuss the part of is it? Is it available commercially? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yes, it is commercially available. Um, I cannot tell you the company right now because we got it from our collaborators, but I think it's commercially available. Okay. I think a company from the US. Okay. In which, this is another two-parter, in which brain regions can you measure plaques and do you reach the hippocampus? Um, 
Well, uh, we are restricted to the areas uh, that we can reach with the two photon microscope. So we have a limited penetration depth. Uh, well, theoretically about 800 micrometer practically for, for these long-term imaging experiments. We look normally at 300 to 400 micrometer depth from the brain surface. And there we can look at the frontal cortex, the visual cortex, somatosensic sensory cortex, so all upper parts of the brain. And uh, the, the hippocampus we didn't reach so far, and we, we didn't try it, actually. Um, well, there are some other in vivo studies out, out there now. Um, they, they use a different kind of technique to reach the hippocampus and did uh, in vivo two photon imaging there. And actually with this technique, it might be possible, but it uh, involves uh, the removing of a part of the, of the mm -hmm. cortex above the hippocampus. So it's a bit more invasive, I would say. Is it possible to trace intracellular abeca? Well, uh, for at least with this technique we are using, we would need a dye that uh, would stain our intracellular abeta. And actually with metoxy, we, we don't know exactly if it really um, penetrates through the cell membrane, um, but there is this other dye, it's called FSB. It stains both uh, tau aggregates and um, and and also a beta aggregates, so plaques. Um, maybe with this one it might be possible, but it's also difficult to distinguish then some autofluorescent signals from inside the cell and and the dye itself. So I would say it's quite challenging to to try this. Okay, I've got another two-parter for you. Do you see vascular deposition of amyloid? And if so, does this have any regional dependence? So in the TG2576 mouse model that we used and the data that we have shown you, uh, we see um, the vascular deposits, so the uh, cerebral angiopathy. And we can also stain them with the with the metoxy. And I cannot, or I haven't investigated really quantitatively if this is really regional. So what I've seen is that it's mostly on the upper blood vessels, the surface blood vessels, the very big ones. But it's also develops further, or it goes further along these vessels. So if you first see uh, uh, one one um, deposit appearing at the blood vessel, it will go along the complete blood vessel uh, later on. So there is also a kinetic taking place. Yeah. Do you see any evidence for the hypothetical sink effect for amyloid deposition? Um, sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? Sure. Do you see any evidence? for the hypothetical sink effect for amyloid deposition? I'm sorry, I didn't get the middle part of the oh, question. Oh. Ah, here. Ah, okay. Did you see any? Shall I move to the, shall I move to the next one? Yes. I think, uh... Sure. Sure. Do all of your transgenic mice display the cerebral amyloid angiopathy phenotype? Um, can you? Um, yes, so um, then the TG2576 mouse model, I think we always see it. But um, we are testing also other mice, for example, um, a mouse from the Yucca lab, um, which actually doesn't, does not show any angiopathy. So, um, yes, it's dependent on the transgenic mouse model. Okay. And the next one um, also has a few parts, so let me know if you want me to repeat. Can you explain the Swedish mutation again? Is it similar to the AD42 mediated neurodegeneration, and is it available in Drosphilia? 
it's available and working. Um, yes, Mama. So the Swedish mutation um, is a mutation that is uh, related to, to the beta secretase cleavage site and it leads to an increased production of the A beta peptide. And the length of the A beta peptide, uh, so because um, uh, is, um, is dependent on the gamma secretase, so not on the beta secretase. So the Swedish mutation leads to, uh, to an overall increase in the A beta peptide. And of course, the A beta 42 is a bit longer than the other A beta 40. The uh, mostly appearing uh, or length of this peptide, um, but this is not not changed by this mutation. So this is normally changed by mutations in the in the gamma secretase complex. And uh, is it available in Drosophila? In, in where? Drosophila. Drosophila. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if there is a model in, in Drosophila. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it looks like we have time perhaps for one more question. What is the resolution of two photon technique? Well, um, X and Y direction, it's about uh, 0 0.3 to 4 micrometers. And in that direction, about one, one micrometer to one half to two, depending on the optical settings and the microscope itself. Okay. Well, that concludes our question and answer period. I would like to thank our sponsor, Bitplane, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 2015. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. The recording of this lecture and information about the upcoming webinars in the search series will also be available on bitplane.com slash search. See you next time. Goodbye.